And we need the supernatural action of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds. Not only to understand, but mainly to receive, to believe in these words. Please come to us. Open our hearts and minds to welcome, to receive this word. We will see today that this word is Jesus. And receive, receiving this word is the same of receiving Jesus. Help us to understand that and to believe in Jesus with all our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, what child is this? This is a question that we repeat every Christmas. Every Christmas, we need to answer that question again and again. What child is But more than answer this question, we also need to answer uh, the following question. What believers are we? Not only what child is this, but what believers are we? Because if we know that we believe in the message of this child, this is an answer that brings consequences for us. And today, in the next two Sundays, we will talk here about this question, what child is this? And to begin, I, I need to uh, present to you two wrong approaches to this question. They are very common today. The first one is deconstruction and projection, which happens when we make Jesus a symbol to validate our own ideology. When I have my own convictions and want someone famous to validate it. It happens, for example, when we uh, know that there's a famous actor in Hollywood who is, for example, part of a free church. Oh, you know that Denzel Washington is a believer and he is member of a free church. We say that because we need to have someone, some reference to validate what we believe. And this happens very commonly with Jesus. I have here some books written about Jesus from this perspective of deconstruction and projection. They see Jesus as the greatest therapist or the greatest leader, a CEO. I heard about a coach who uses Jesus in his lectures for businessmen. Jesus as a greatest, great leader, or the greatest philosopher, or the greatest physician, or a revolutionary leader. This book, Zealot. It's very interesting. If you are against government, so this is your book. You'll find Jesus as a revolutionary leader. Or then, if you are very committed to Black Lives Matter, you find a black Jesus. This is the book, The Black Christ. 
So, we make Jesus represent, uh, representing us. We need someone holy, pure, to represent what we believe. But this is the wrong approach. Jesus is not what I want, but Jesus is what he is. And we need another way. But if we have this first wrong approach, deconstruction and projection, we also have the danger of apathy and indifference. When we have the right knowledge, the right answers, and nothing else. When the problem is not lack of information, you know all the right answers. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Christ. But what else? How does this affect your life, daily life? I have a friend in Brazil who is a pastor, and he wrote a, a very interesting article called The New Atheist. And he said, today, the atheist is no longer one who does not believe, but one who does not find relevance for God in his daily life. The new atheism doesn't need to deny the faith. It just creates substitutes for it. It keeps the believer in the church, but away from his Savior. This happens when we know everything, when we have the right answers and nothing else. I love uh, A.W. Tozer. He has very good texts and insights about Christianity. And one of them, one of his pearls is this quote where he says the present position of Christ in the gospel churches may be likened to that of a king in a limited constitutional monarchy the king sometimes depersonalized by the term the crown is in such a country no more than a traditional rallying point, a pleasant symbol of unity and loyalty, much like a flag or a national anthem. He is lauded, fated, and supported, but his real authority is small. Nominally, he is head over all, but in every crisis, someone else makes the decisions. On formal occasions, he appears in his royal attire to deliver the tame, colorless speech put into his mouth by the real rulers of the country. I love this quote because sometimes Jesus is like the queen. You love the queen. You love to say, oh, save the queen, the immortal queen. <laughs> but the question is, what is the relevance of the queen in your daily life? When you take your decisions, when you make your plans and dreams, what is her role? Zero. <laughs> doesn't matter. Many times we know everything about Jesus, but he is like the queen, just a reference there, not here with me in my daily life. So the question behind this first question is, how does the gospel of John, uh, sorry, uh, 
Do you know Jesus or know about Jesus? So, sorry about that. Do you know Jesus or know about Jesus? Dallas Wheeler said that presumed familiarity has led to unfamiliarity. Unfamiliarity has led to contempt, and contempt has led to profound ignorance. This is a question for us. When we answer, what child is this? We also need to answer, what believers are we? And this is what we are doing right now. This Sunday, today, we will talk about Jesus as presented, introduced by the Gospel of John. And I will read here just four verses. As you know, John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Probably, he was the closest person to Jesus. And it's interesting that unlike the other evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there is no reference to the nativity scene. John, Mary, the angels, Gabriel, shepherds, a star, the wise men. Nothing about that. Herod, nothing. The way John introduces Jesus is very different. But I think this should be our starting point. To know Jesus through John's lens. And see what he says. This is the word of God. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and then verses 14. In the beginning was the word. Jesus, uh, John is talking here about Jesus, right? He is introducing Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And what, without Him was not anything made that was made. And then verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen this glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. My original plan for today was to preach on these first 14 verses, John 1, 1 to 14. But I need to confess that I was reading and studying and reflecting and praying about this text. And I came to the conclusion, it's too much for me. Actually, these four verses, they are too much for me. We are in front of one of the most sacred and profound texts of the scripture. Have you ever faced a challenge that you felt completely inadequate and incom incompetent to accomplish? This is my feeling right now. How can I say something more than John here? How can I understand what John is saying here? It's too much. We can think about that hours and hours. And we still be on the surface of what John is saying here. This is why the best word I found 
to, to describe these four verses is the word mystery. It's interesting that John is introducing Jesus. This is the revelation of Jesus. But what we have here is mystery. And we have in these four verses three of the greatest mysteries of Christian faith. In just four verses, we have at least three great mysteries. The first mystery is the pre existence of Christ. And this is a great mystery. John is talking about a friend, Jesus. You know that after the death and the resurrection of Christ, Jesus took care of Mary, Jesus' mom. And probably John was with Mary all the time in the city of Ephesus. And he's talking about Jesus, probably with Mary with him. But he, he doesn't tell us anything about the boy Jesus, the baby Jesus. He affirmed here something extraordinary. He starts his gospel saying, in the beginning. And for everyone reading the gospel of John, everyone who had the scripture, the Old Testament, the first thinking, hearing in the beginning, was to remember what? Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created. So, John is referring here to the creation. To the beginning of time. To the beginning of everything. And he is more specific. He says, he, Jesus, was in the beginning with God. It's interesting that the Gospel of Mark starts with the same words. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then John came after Mark and starts his Gospel with the same words, in the beginning. But John here is going far beyond. He's talking here about the beginning of the universe. And we can see, not only here, but in other passages of John, this truth, the truth of the pre-existence of Christ. Jesus was there, but the understanding of John was that Jesus didn't start when he was born. I started living on February 10th, 1974. I was born. Actually, I, I was alive before that, <laughs> right? But my life here outside the womb of my mom, February 10th, 1974. But Supposing that Jesus was born on December 25, uh, year, sorry, zero. <laughs> we know that this is not the exact date, but let's suppose that. What John is saying is that his life didn't start there. And you can think, no, this is just an opinion. Jesus didn't, said, didn't say that. Let's see two verses in John. John chapter 8, verses 57 and 59. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before 
Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. Abraham, Abraham lived 2,000 years before Christ. And Jesus is saying, before Abraham was, I am. How can we can understand that? It's a mystery. And then, in John 17, Jesus is praying. And he says something that none, zero, none of us can pray in this way. We can't pray like Jesus in this way. He says, now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Wow. Can you pray in this way? No. Because you had no glory before uh, the world existed. But Jesus had. What John is saying here is, is about the pre-existence of Christ. And I love when Tim Keller says that Christmas is not simply about a birth, but about a coming. It's interesting that John many times in his gospel talks, uses the verb send, sending. And he says, John chapter 6, For I have come down from heaven, Jesus saying, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And there's a Greek word, tempo, that John likes so much. You can see that Matthew, Mark, and Luke together uses this word, Greek word, tempo, which means to send, a verb, 15 times. But John, only John, uses this word 32 times. Because for John, it's very important to understand that Jesus was not only, he was not only born, he was sent. We were born, but Jesus was sent. It's very important to understand that the pre-existence of Christ is the first mystery we have here. To understand what child is this. And then we have the second mystery. Which in some way answers the first mystery. How is that Jesus was before the world? Yes. And how can we explain that? The second mystery. The divinity of Christ. John says, in the beginning was the word. It's interesting that he, he doesn't say the beginning was the king or was the son of God. No. The savior. No. He says in the beginning was the word. And this word, word here is very, very important. And I need to say that John was absolutely brilliant because he was inspired. Because this word had a very strong meaning to Gentiles, to Greek people. It was a very important word. If you go to study philosophy, you will see the word logos many times. Which means logic. Which means... Word, speech, message, reason, discourse. From the word logos, we have the word logic. We have, for example, theology, psychology, archaeology. All of them come from logos. For the Greek, the meaning of the universe, the reason, the connection, the harmony of the universe is explained by the word logos. This is 
the way the Greeks understood this word. But John, and I believe that John here is using this word not necessarily with this Greek background. Because John was a Jewish. And the background of John was the scripture, not the philosophy. And when we go to the scripture, this word is very, very important. Because John first said, in the beginning, Genesis 1. And what happened in the beginning? Let's see that this word have, has a very important meaning in the scripture in the Old Testament. For example, in the creation. How the creation happened. And God said. If you read Genesis chapter 1, you see this expression 10 times in Genesis chapter 1. And then God said. God said. And as God was saying, things were happening. The world was being created by the word of God. And John is saying, in the beginning was the word, the word of God. And Psalm 33 verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. So the word of God was active in the Old Testament in the creation. But not only that, also in the revelation. There is a very interesting detail in the Old Testament. Exodus 34. He wrote on tablets the words of the covenant. The Ten Commandments. You used to say the Ten Commandments. We know the Ten Commandments. But when you go to the scripture in the, Exod in the book of Exodus, the Hebrew word that you find there is not commandments. We don't find Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus. We find the Ten Words. It's interesting. We like to call the ten words, ten commandments. But what the Bible says is that we have ten words. Because the word of God is enough for us. God, by his word, not only created the world, but he says how we should live. And then we have these ten words. More than that, many times in the Old Testament, we have this expression. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, God revealed himself, his moral being, and his will for us through his word. The word of God has this revelational aspect. But not only that, not only the word creates, not only the word reveals, but the word, the word also saves. Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. The word of God saves this was in the Old Testament. And not only that, but the word of God in the Old Testament also brings judgment. Amos 3.1 Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel. So you can see that the word of God can create, can save, can judge, can reveal. This is the background that John has. And then he is saying here, introducing Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. 
and the word was God. All things were made through him. Genesis chapter 1. Jesus was the agent that was with God, creating all things. Every time God says, there be the light, Jesus. Every time God says to a prophet, tell my people, Jesus. Jesus is present because he is pre-existent. Existent. He is God. And here we have a great mystery. Because it would be very easy to understand, no, no, God is Jesus, Jesus is God. Okay. But the fact is that we have here something very, very difficult to understand. Actually impossible. Because John says, he was with God. And we understand that, okay, Jesus was there with God. But he was another person. I can say, I was there with Barreto. It doesn't mean that I am Barreto. Right? I was with him. He is a person. I am another person. So John is saying, he was with God. Okay. Distinct from God. But just after that, he says, he was God. Oh my how can I understand that? Please, John, explain yourself. He was with God or he was God? Because both, I can't understand that. Can you see we have here a mystery? The roots of the understanding we have from God about Trinity Three persons, one God, one essence, and three persons. Can you understand? No, I can't. It's a mystery. But the fact is, Jesus, John, is affirming here that Jesus was really God in the creation of all things. Second mystery. The book of Hebrews, chapter 1, says something very similar to John chapter 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he was spoken to us by his son. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And the exact imprint of his nature. Because he was with God and he was God. Jesus was the word. The word is part of me. But at the same time, when I speak my word, the word are different from me. They are me, but they are not me. <laughs> The word. I reveal to you, I reveal myself, my thinking, through my word. I can think many things, and you never know what I think, unless I speak to you. And I say, this is what I am thinking. My word. Hear me. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the way God expresses himself to us. Unless we have Jesus, we never would understand or know nothing about God. What John is saying here is that Jesus is the word. Jesus is the way we can understand, we can know, we can have access to God. Because he is his word. He can create life. He can save us. He can reveal to us. And he also can judge us by his word. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is the word of God, the Alpha and Omega. And the book says that a great sword comes from his 
mouth the word. This is a mystery. And then we have the third mystery. Maybe the biggest one. The first mystery was pre-existence of, of Christ. The second mystery, the divinity of Christ. And then we have the third, mini, uh, third mystery. And this third mystery helped us to understand the following question. John would think, hey, we follow this man. He was a man. We follow Jesus. We saw his miracles. We touched him. We had access. We ate with him. We were traveling with him. We walked with him. So how can I understand that this person was fully God? And the answer is on verse 14 about the incarnation of Christ. This is the third mystery you have about Christ to answer the question, what child is this? And the word, this eternal word, divine word, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. How could Jesus of Nazareth be God? It's interesting that in these four verses, John is establishing the two most important things about Jesus. The Word was with God, and He was God, divinity. And then, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Humanity. Full man. Full God. And how can we connect these two truths? Incarnation. The incarnation is the way we can understand who Jesus is. And it's important, very important. Let me say something to you. Skeptical people think that Jesus became God. Jesus was seen, understood as God by his followers. He was not God, but he was considered by God. And then, for skeptical people who don't believe, the most important question is, how Jesus became God? We have this book from a liberal theologian. And he tried to answer how Jesus became God. And then we had another group of theologian, theologians who understood what John is saying. Who wrote this book, How God Became Jesus. Because the great mystery, brothers and sisters, is not how Jesus became God, but how God became Jesus. This is, this is the question. Because he was first God and then he became flesh. His original state was not human being, was God. And here we have a great mystery. If I was crying, trying to understand the first two mysteries, then I came to, to this mystery. God and man, one person. Trinity, three persons, one being, one, one essence. Christ, one person, two essences, two natures. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. John Stott said, the paradox is amazing. The creator assumes the human frailty of his creatures. The eternal one enters time. The all-powerful makes himself vulnerable. The all-holy exposes himself to temptation. And in the end, the immortal 
tais. You can understand that? No. Can I understand that? Never. It's a mystery. But it's the way John presents Jesus to us. It's interesting that he uses the word here, a very known word in the Old Testament. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. If you go to the original text here, you will see not the word abide or reside or live. No. What we have here in the Greek text is the word became flesh and tabernacled with us, among us. The same word, the same translation of the Hebrew word used by Moses describing the tabernacle, which was the presence of God in the, amongst his people in the desert. Jesus, uh, God came in the desert and set up his tent with his people. And now Jesus, John is saying, Jesus came and set up his tent with us. Eugene Peterson says that Jesus came, the word became flesh, and moved to our neighborhood. Imagine, I live in Evergreen. And then Jesus came and bought a house to live near in Evergreen. It's amazing. And what is the purpose of that? We will talk about this very quickly because I have no more time. Time's up. But just three mysteries, the pre-existence of Christ, the divinity of Christ, the incarnation of Christ. And how do you respond to a mystery? This is my last and maybe I will spend more five minutes here and I will finish. I'm done. How do you respond to a mystery? You can deny. You can say, I can understand, I can't accept, I deny. If I don't understand, I deny. I know that we have some engineer, engineering guys here, engineers in our church. So right now I'm not talking to you. Let's talk to other people. Do you know how a fly, uh, an airplane fly? Do you know? Can you understand that? Do you know all the physics? No. Do you know how can a sheep, uh, what's the word? Uh, yeah, this word. We don't know. But the fact is that sometimes we buy tickets to go in a fly, in an airplane. How do you respond to a mystery? John says, and here is the core of the gospel. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, of man but of God. It's interesting that Jesus... John is talking, introducing Jesus, and instead of talking about Jesus' birth, he talks about our birth in Jesus. <laughs> this word believed is the key word here. 
The purpose of John's gospel is in chapter 20, verse 31. So, Jesus did and spoke and walked and whatever. He did what he did. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. And here we have other word from John. Let me show you this picture. Matthew, Mark, and Luke together, together, they use the word believe, the, word, the Greek word pisteo, pisteo, to believe 30 times. Only John uses the same word. 19 eight times. I think John had a crush in this word. Believe. He was obsessed with this word. And I will show you many times in the book of John. We see people that didn't believe and people that believe. Two different reactions. We don't have a third option. These people, they, don't, they didn't believe. When Jesus cleansed the temple, chapter 2. When he healed a paralytic, chapter 5. When he fed the crowds, chapter 6. When his brothers were treated by him with sarcasm. Sorry. When his brothers treated him with sarcasm. Not were treated, right? Delete were. And then... When he attended the Feast of Tabernacles, chapter 7. When he said, I am the light of the world, chapter 8. When he said that he and he, the Father was one, chapter 10. And when he resurrected Lazarus, chapter 11. All these times, the text of John says the same. And they didn't believe. Despite of all miracles... All signs, all words, they didn't believe. But then we have the good examples. John the Baptist believed, chapter 1. The disciples, the, sorry, the disciples believed three times in the gospel. A Samaritan woman believed. An official and his family believed. Many people in Jerusalem believed. A blind man who was healed believed. Many Jewish leaders believed. Many Jews believed. All these verses, John says and repeats, they believed. Because at the end, the great question, once we understand who this child is, is our answer. The final answer is, do you believe? Okay, I, I believe. No, no, I'm not talking. It's interesting that in Portuguese we have one more word. and It's easier to explain that. But in English we have believe. And we use believe just to say that we know about thank, uh, something. And to say that we really believe, we trust in something. This is why we need really to understand the concept of this word, believe. Because if you believe that an airplane can fly, but you never buy a ticket to fly because you are afraid, you don't believe. Right? To believe is to invest your life in this. Is to face persecution. Is to face consequences because you believe. If you can't rest, if you live anxious about the future, it's because you don't believe that Jesus is pre-existence. 
existence, the Alpha and the Omega. He is in control of everything. He is God. And He is the incarnation. More than that, because He incarnated, He knows what we feel. He knows what mean to be betrayed, rejected. He knows what is suffering because he incarnated. Think about the conditions that Jesus was born. A long journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Shame. Mary was pregnant and the angel came to her. But the angel didn't come to the city. And imagine Mary saying, I'm pregnant, but this is from the, God, the Holy Spirit. Ha <laughs> ha. I believe you, Mary. What did you know, Mary? <laughs> what did you do, Mary? Imagine the shame. The rejection. They came in Bethlehem. Nobody, no place for them. Jesus knows since his birth what the human condition is because he incarnated. You never can say, you don't understand me, God. You are God. No, he understood. He understands. So the question is, do you believe that? Do you trust God? Do you Obey God. Because if you say, no, oh, I believe. In the same way, I believe in Queen Elizabeth. Okay, I, I also believe in Queen Elizabeth. But the question is, who is the ruler of your life? If Jesus is the king, how do you make your decisions? You can say, no, this decision is clearly oriented, based on Jesus, the Word of God. He revealed to me. If we can't say that, so maybe we need to believe. I know it's a mystery. Tertullian, on the third century, he said, I believe because it's absurd. The word that John uses is not understand, it's believe. You can understand and still not believe. He, he didn't know. Jesus did what he did that we can understand God. No, he said he did. So we can believe even when we can't understand everything we live in this age of information people know everything we have Dr. Google every mystery every fact every intention people know we know what you are doing. We know. This is not the question. You can know. But the question is, do you believe? Do you trust? Do you follow? Do you obey? This is the question that John is making here. Let's pray. Next week, we will talk about Jesus as our Savior. Today we talked about Jesus as the supreme king, the word of God, who rules everything, this pre-existent Christ, this divine Christ, this incarnate Christ. And next week we will talk about Jesus uh, as presented by the gospel of Luke. Today we talked about Jesus as presented by John. Next week we will talk about Jesus as presented by the Gospel of Luke. 
And we will understand that Jesus came to save the lost ones. He is our Savior. Uh, and what does it mean? Maybe you can think, no, I don't need salvation. Yeah, I, I have a good life. Why salvation? Let's talk about that next week. Let's pray and then we finish. Heavenly Father, we are here, as we said in the beginning, before your word. Not only a book, but your real word, which is Jesus. He is alive. He was alive even before he was born. We don't understand these mysteries, but we can accept by faith. We can believe and we can trust. This is the final question, Lord, and help us to answer. I know that it's difficult. We have so many questions that we don't understand. But help us to understand that Jesus is the final word. Logos. The logic of the universe. The meaning of the universe. Is in Jesus. Without Jesus. There is nothing created. There is no salvation, no revelation. Help us, Lord, to trust in Jesus. To see in Jesus of Nazareth more than a great leader, a great philosopher, a great uh, revolutionary man, a psychologist. Help us to see in Him what John saw and help us to believe. This is the prayer we pray right now. In Jesus' name, the Word of God. Amen.